In the digital age, it feels like life moves too far, too fast. That's why we need wise guides, such as Jay Kim, author of Analog Christian, cultivating contentment, resilience, and wisdom in the digital age, new from IVP. Jay writes this, This is where we are in the digital age, existing in an untenable state of unceasing connection to the curated lives of others, all of their highlights, none of their lowlights. Now, perhaps the simple solution for us would be to spend more time offline, but our colorful smartphones make the real world look grayscale in comparison. Jay writes this, quote, because much of life in the real world is uncomfortable, awkward, or boring, so we opt for digital escape. We increasingly prefer and default to worlds of our own making, end quote. Now, you might know Jay from his previous book, Analog Church. He's the lead pastor of teaching at Westgate Church in Silicon Valley and teacher in residence at Vintage Faith Church in Santa Cruz, California. He joins me now on Gospel Bound to discuss comparison and contempt, love on the move, the design of social media, hate and hurt, chronological snobbery, and more. Jay, thanks for joining me on Gospel Bound. Thanks so much for having me, Colin. Now, Jay, how did growing up in Silicon Valley shape your perspective in writing this book? Yeah, I get asked that question quite a bit. <laughs> so I've thought about it quite a bit. I, I think, you know, I, I uh, grew up in a single parent home, just my mother and I. When I was a kid, we actually lived with my uncle who worked at IBM and uh, worked on computers at IBM. So our house, you know, in, this is like the mid 80s. It was chock full of these big giant, you know, uh, PCs. And uh, I remember playing um, these little uh, Winter Olympics video games on these computers. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the ubiquity of technology, digital technology, um, it's just, it's been the air I've breathed for 40 years. And uh, so, in some ways, you know, I think one of the things that's done for me is it's um, taken some of the sheen off, uh, some of the gloss off. You know, even today, the church where I serve on staff, we are 10 minutes uh, from the main campus of Apple. And one of the things that means for us is that um, a, a very high percentage of our folks work in tech and a great percentage of those folks work at Apple. Um, there, there are three people in my small group alone, three out of the eight, you know, who work at Apple. And, um, so, uh, I, I, it's a benefit, you know, and I consider it a privilege in my conversations with these friends. Uh, I get to see peek behind the curtain a little bit and, um, it helps me actually, uh, think about the devices in our back pockets and in our offices for what they actually are in the real world, which are um, these boxes, <laughs> you know, these little black boxes that we find ourselves staring into. So I think that's one of the gifts of having been uh, here my entire life, having sort of breathed this digital air is that um, – I just have a propensity for seeing it uh, for what it actually is in the real world in a tactile sort of analog way. That's not to say I don't struggle with digital addiction just like the rest. Um, I do. I certainly do. It's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. But yeah, it has been a gift living here. Well, let's, let's go right off that statement there. Explain the connection you found between discontentment and digital influence on comparison and contempt. Yeah, you know, um, some psychologists uh, a couple of decades ago coined this term, the hedonic treadmill, uh, meaning, you know, hedonic coming from hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure. And they said it's a treadmill because on a treadmill, you're constantly chasing, but you're never arriving. And they use that phrase to describe uh, the modern and late modern Western world that most of us in the developed Western world live life on a hedonic treadmill. And um, for me, especially with the rise of social media in the past decade or so, personally, I found myself sort of exhausted on that treadmill. And uh, I, I was fascinated by the, the, the disconnection between what I intellectually knew, which was that these sort of glossy feeds of my friends were not real life. I knew that that was true. I knew that my friends weren't spending every moment of their life 
on a white sand beach in the Maldives. I knew that on Monday <laughs> they'd be right back at the cubicle just like me. Yeah. And yet there was something disconnected from what I knew in my mind to everything else I felt in my body, which essentially was, why isn't your life like that? Why why are you sitting here in the boredom of your mundane, ordinary Tuesday while they're living the dream? And I could not make the connection between my intellect, my knowledge, and my physical body. Um, and I think it's one of the really powerful, formative uh, you know, effects of social media in particular, but just the digital age as a whole, is that because it's primarily a disembodied reality, um, it, we, we end up uh, you know, in the complexity of navigating how we bodily react and respond um, to the, the to the disembodied feeds that we are seeing. And I think our bodies in some ways don't even know what to do with it. We're so this is so new. It's a new technology in the sort of long span of history that I think humans are still adjusting. And in the chaos of that adjustment, I think, um, you know, comparison and contempt are really unraveling us in, in significant ways. And, and I still, you know, even have, after having written a couple of books about analog, the reality is in my everyday life, I still have to be really intentional about not spiraling into the sort of vortex of comparison and, uh, you know, discontentment and, and contempt toward those who are sort of presenting a particular life online. I think I think most people can can probably relate to that in some form or fashion. Oh, no doubt about that. Here's a quote of yours that stood out. You write, social media's algorithms are designed to feed us a never-ending loop of our desired lives, always just a handful of steps ahead of where we are, deceptively within arm's reach, but always just beyond our grasp by design. We find ourselves envying upward and desiring downward. I think, Jay, the, the key phrase there is by design. And it makes me wonder, do we have any option except abstinence from social media when we're combating this problem? <laughs> That's a great question. I mean, I will say I think abstinence is um, a fantastic option if you are able. Uh, and I would say for the follower of Jesus who wants to experience you know, the spirit filled life and experience the fruit of the spirit in their life. Um, I would say uh, engagement um, and, and especially heavy, regular, consistent engagement on social media uh, should only come after the long journey of doing the work, right? Creating particular parameters in your life to guard against um, the ill effects of social media. Uh, so abstinence is a, a beautiful, um, and, and profoundly effective option. I think that if Christians are going to engage in social media, I think we need to emphatically engage with a redemptive edge and a purpose rather than the way social media typically lulls us in, which is, Hey, fill every moment of downtime and boredom with me. You know what I mean? When you're waiting at the grocery store in the in the line or the DMV or waiting for your coffee uh, as your barista makes your coffee or the first thing you do in the morning when you wake up, open me up and engage. You know, I, I think that's a very dangerous way to engage. It, I don't think social media, especially for the Christian, should be um, a recreational endeavor. I think it needs to be a redemptive engagement, meaning we have a purpose for why we are going online. Um, it is to uh, add redemptive voice um, to the conversation. And, you know, we need to do so uh, with again the the characteristics of the fruit of the spirit, you know, is this engagement making you a more loving person? You know, is it is it adding to your joy? Are you are you a bearer of peace? You know, on and on. Um, are you being kind? Are you being good? Uh, and that's not to fudge on truth. It's not to say like, oh, you know, everyone do their thing and I support everybody. That's not it at all, of course. But can you engage? Um, be a bearer of truth, for example, with kindness and with goodness, you know, with self-control. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that every follower of Jesus needs to ask some hard questions uh, before they engage online. So you alluded there to to the, the fruit of the Spirit, starting there with love. 
Uh, you write in the book, love comes alive when it's on the move. Have you seen anyone do that well online? Rarely, <laughs> rarely, <laughs> but I have seen, I have seen steps in that direction. Um, you know, uh, in fact, just recently, a mutual friend of ours, um, Patrick Miller, who's done some work for the gospel coalition. He just recently wrote a fantastic article, um, uh, about Facebook in particular and sort of the algorithms, you know, I just saw him tweet and, and Patrick is, is quite, uh, active on Twitter, and he's quite winsome on Twitter. I think he's an example of of what maybe an extension of love on social media can look like. He just recently tweeted uh, about a conversation he had with somebody with whom he very staunchly disagrees on key matters. But what he said was, this was an example of a loving conversation where we can disagree, where we can have um, healthy, robust debate but in love. And then what he did was he actually highlighted what he learned in this conversation from this person with whom he disagrees, you know? And I think that's, it's, it's not love in its fullest for sure. Uh, my, my suggestion would be that love uh, in its fullest is primarily, again, an analog embodied experience, but it is at least an extension of, lo of love and a redemptive stepping into what is sort of a wasteland you know, the, the digital world. So, um, yeah, I mean, there are other people who do this well, uh, but, but it is difficult is what I would say. And the algorithms are not designed to support that sort of behavior online. It's not a neutral medium. Uh, I think a lot of Christians want to assume that everything's about what you make of it, that everything's more or less a dull tool in the end. And they don't realize that they are even each different social media platform itself has different characteristics, different incentives, different modes of communication, ultimately different cultures. And I think we get ourselves into a lot of trouble uh, seeing them as merely utilitarian as opposed to formative. Um, now, of course, Jay, your book, Analog Christian, is about l discipleship, more or less, in a digital age. It's not exclusively about things like social media. It's just a, kind of a big part of what you talk about in here. But you, you reflect on a number of broader themes. And one of them is, I'll just say, it's not natural, at least for Americans, a lot of the people listening here, to assume that struggle leads to blessing and then to joy, like you talk about in the book. Uh, that We don't find happiness by looking for it. But this makes me wonder, does that mean we should then go looking for struggle? <laughs> you know, I, I, no, I, I would say first and foremost, no, you know, we shouldn't go looking for struggle. Um, however, we don't really need to look for struggle. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the right answer. Hum, right human experience, you know, <laughs> yeah. it is inevitable. So fine, you yeah. will struggle. So uh, it, it's almost like, you know, a fish asking, should I go looking for water? Well, no, you swim in water. So, so the question is, how will you navigate the waters that you swim in? And I think in, again, in America in particular, particularly because of, you know, despite all of the conversation about how bad things are, the reality is we are still the most affluent society in the history of humankind at this point. Um, so I think we, uh, have sort of bought the cultural myth and the cultural narrative that humans in and of themselves, uh, with our ingenuity, intellect, skill, resources, um, that we can invent and create and cultivate some sort of human utopia. And the biblical narrative seems to indicate that that is utterly false, right? That it is God and only God and his redemptive action in the world through Jesus, his son, uh, that can, can, can lead us essentially lead us home, you know, lead us um, to the sort of reality that that God always intended, you know, in Genesis 1 and 2. So, you know, I, I, in the book, I quote um, Bob Dylan, and he juxtaposes in this Rolling Stone magazine interview um, several decades ago, he juxtaposes happiness with blessedness, you know, and I think that the it's not that Christians are not called to be happy. I think that's a misnomer. In fact, the New Testament word for blessed can actually probably be translated into the English word happy in some ways. However, the word happiness has been sort of in some ways hijacked by culture. And essentially what we mean is feeling good, you know, and um, that's what most of us really want. 
uh, at least in our flesh. We want to medicate uh, to the point where we can just feel good. You know, the data bears this out in terms of the various addictions that are running rampant in our culture today. But the blessed life, you know, in God's blessing, the power of it is that it has the strength um, to withstand struggle. It has the strength um, to become our foundation and a bedrock, not um, after struggle, but in the midst of struggle, you know, in the midst of, of the valley. But it takes a lot of work and it really does take a, a significant sort of paradigm shift uh, in terms of what we think a blessed life looks like. You know, it's so funny. You go on Instagram and there are so many posts with the hashtag blessed and they're all images of you know, some fantastic lunch at some Michelin star restaurant or some vacation in Europe. But um, the biblical uh, image of uh, and vision of blessing looks nothing like that. You know, you think about the Beatitudes, it looks nothing like that. It's the poor in spirit who are blessed, you know, and those who mourn and on and on. So I think that paradigm shift needs to happen. But once it happens, um, life takes on a whole new color. You mentioned just there that it, we feel like things are so bad. There's so much attention on that, and yet the reality is quite different. Well, I think that's part of what you're getting at here, what you say about political division. You write this, The depth and breadth of political division I've experienced within our congregation in the past few years far exceeds anything I've ever experienced in all previous years as a pastor combined. Now, I think there's a couple different ways that we can look at this. One of them is that there have been many periods of political division throughout world history, certainly, including American history. So in that sense, this is kind of normative. At the same time, there does some, seem to be something different about our perceptions of it, at least. And I think that's what you're primarily getting at here. So I'm wondering, to what do you attribute that change in the sense of how we are now perceiving our political conflicts and then experiencing these political divisions? Yeah, that's a great question, Colin. Um, in psychology, there's this uh, term, it's called motive attribution asymmetry. It's like a big, long, fancy phrase, but essentially what it means is um, when that takes hold, motive attribution asymmetry, um, and it's asymmetry, not symmetry, what it means is we begin to assume essentially the worst about the other and the best about ourselves. So it's not just with politics, but it's with anything. It's just a psycho psychological idea that when you engage in any sort of tension or debate or, or any, any conflict or disagreement, when that happens to you, motive, uh, uh, motive attribution asymmetry, you begin to assume I am engaging this process in love and kindness. The other person is engaging this process with hatred and anger. You just assume that to be true. And the danger of that reality, that psychological reality, as it sort of intersects with the digital age and social media, Facebook, Twitter, and on and on, is that um, these social media platforms are actually designed to accentuate and highlight and leverage and take advantage of that sort of tendency in human beings to assume the worst about the other and assume the best about self. And there's various reasons for it. One of the two, two reasons in particular. One, the algorithms are designed to feed off of that sort of energy. Um, and it it just increases the bottom dollar uh, for companies like Twitter and and Facebook, right? It just reveals more engagement. You think about, you know, last year there was the whistleblower from Facebook, right? And she revealed all this documentation from the company that revealed they're very aware of how this works and they're propagating it. I'm not here to bash any sort of platform. It's just reality. And um, so, uh, you know, for me, I think that's the danger. It's one of the unique dangers we face in the digital age is that there was already sort of a built-in psychological uh, reality that pushes us as human beings to assume the worst about the other, assume the best about myself and my tribe. Um, and now, all of those conversations are being mediated on platforms um, that essentially feed off of that reality, accentuating it, amplifying it, deepening it in us, which is why we're losing in the digital age our aptitude for nuance, 
for um, kindness, for listening, for learning, and it, everything's becoming far more black and white. And I'm not saying there isn't black and white. There is black and white with particular issues. But the way we engage one another, you know, I think in terms of the way of Jesus uh, has to be with gentleness, kindness, love, you know, hospitality, uh, openness, compassion. And the danger is we're, we're losing our aptitude for that, particularly when it comes to politics. It seems that, especially as a pastor, as an authority figure, you've had to learn this, but I think this will be helpful for anybody who's listening. How do you know when you're experiencing hate from someone, but it's actually their hurt that you're experiencing? Mm. Almost always. I, you know, I, I'll, I'll stop just short of saying always, but I think almost always hate is um, in some ways uh, connected to deep hurt. I think that's almost always true. So I actually would suggest uh, just my opinion that I think one of the most healthy ways to engage disagreement uh, and tension is to assume that any sort of expression of hate is connected to some deep hurt. Now, if you are wrong and there is no deep hurt and the person is just a hateful person, um, it's not really much of a loss. You're just right back where you started. The person hates me. <laughs> the person hates my ideas. The person is hateful, you know? And, and, and in those instances, it, in my experience, it can be difficult to make any sort of real significant progress. But again, most of the time, almost all of the time, hate is connected in some form or fashion to hurt. And if you can tap into that reality, uh, one, um, empathy begins uh, to increase. And I think that empathy creates the necessary space um, for the sort of meaningful engagement and dialogue uh, that can move things forward. It's one of the reasons why I love, you know, the Gospel Coalition's work with um, the good faith debates. You know, there are these disagreements, but the whole premise of those debates is we're not going to yell and scream at one another. We're going to engage with kindness, compassion, generosity, and love in the midst of disagreement. And I think it models for us, you know, how we might engage. Uh, another challenge that you pick up on here in the book, um, and I thought was really helpful that I think maybe we take for granted. It's such a big problem. You write this, truth established over the long span of history matters little in the chronological snobbery of the digital age. You know, we could, you know, Jay, we could talk about all kinds of different, all kinds of different situations, all di kinds of different ways that our society has transformed, but this might be most fundamental. Um, the way, and maybe that's why I started off the podcast by talking about how quick life moves. And look, I think every generation for at least the last 150 years has felt like life just is moving too quickly. It's one reason why the Amish, they literally slow down what they're doing. That's why they do horses, buggies, things like that, slowing down the pace of life. But it seems like underneath everything, digital media meet and digital mediation seems to erode any sense of connectedness to the past. That is a problem for us as people of the book. <laughs> what, are, what are we supposed to do about this? I think we need to see the sort of cultural clout that comes with being post something for what it is, that it's a sham and that it's essentially um, trying to wear hip cool clothes. And I know that that sounds really harsh. Um, you know, I, and I, and I know that there are, what I'm not saying is that people don't have new ideas that are valid and helpful, but, um, you know, uh, Dr. AJ Swoboda, uh, who's a good friend, he, he writes in his book, he says that being post anything now is a sign of maturity and, that is, that is, I would suggest that is actually a pretty new phenomenon in the long history. And you're saying that's that's the way our culture is seeing things, of being yes. post, whatever. I mean, essentially what you're saying is ideology is fashion yes. in a certain yeah. sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And new ideologies are fashion. Yes. Right. And it literally works like fashion. It's not so much that we are having a sort of rich, robust, sort of in-depth, you know, constructive assessment of a past ideology. It's just moving so fast where we now say, oh, that was last week, man. Today, this week, it's all about this new ideology. And it's it's moving at the pace of cool rather than uh, moving at the pace of, of wisdom and truth. Well, I was talking with a number of, uh, at the Gospel Coalition, we meet with uh, pastors, people in ministry on a regular basis in person and in Zoom just to hear about what they're going through. And I had a group of people working with youth and young adults, college students, people like that. And, and what they were describing was so dystopian. And I said, I don't understand. They all, they don't sound very happy. Uh, <laughs> why, why, why don't? What is this, is this really working for them? And the, the ministers looked at me and said, "These, these people don't, these young people don't care about being happy. They mm. just don't want to get canceled. Mm. Yeah. So it's not about this; these ideas leading to somewhere good. It's about I just need to make sure I'm up with those ideas so that I'm not cast out. That's right into the wilderness. And I thought, oh man, okay, that's a new problem." Yeah. And for an elder millennial like myself, raised in the 90s, that is, um, that's a strange thing to come to yeah. terms with because it seemed like we were pretty concerned with happiness. <laughs> right. More, yeah. more of that hedonism that you were yeah. talking about there. Agree. Um, you know, and this, this leads into that, that, that cool factor, that fashionable factor leads into what you, what you write in the book, which here's another quote I really liked, while achieving cultural relevance isn't all bad, I think what you're saying there is being culturally irrelevant is not a badge of honor somehow, but when it comes at the cost of faithfulness, it's hollow at best and destructive at worst. Again, speaking of cultural relevance. What's the best way, Jay, that you've found to rescue a friend from falling into this cultural relevance trap? I think meaningful relationship always trumps relevance um, because I think the pursuit, you know, I love what you said, Colin. I think it's a really astute point it, rather than a pursuit of genuine meaning. I think most people and especially emerging generations today are driven primarily by a fear of ostracization, you know, of being canceled and uh, really what it comes down to is um, something that that is timelessly true since the beginning in that human beings want to belong. Nobody wants to be alone. Nobody wants to live out on the margins. And it's because God is a relational God, three in one, triune. You know, when the Bible tells us that God is love, on one hand, it's sort of a strange concept, but on the other hand, it makes all the sense in the world because God is three in one. He lives and exists in a loving relationship. And so because we are made in the image of that God, we are made uh, for relationship, to belong, to belong to God and to belong to one another. And I think the way to help people pull out of that sort of rut of the constant chasing for relevance uh, driven by a fear of being canceled is to lean in to relationship in the most meaningful way possible. Again, not on the platforms where relevance is mediated, but to disrupt that rhythm and to get with somebody like shoulder to shoulder over a cup of coffee, a meal, you know, with regularity and consistency and with an invitation to take off the sort of glossy filter and to just be yourself and to be honest and to be genuine and to extend that first, you know, to go first as Christ went first for us and uh, essentially to cut through the sort of the no all of the noise, you know, that screams at our people. You got to be relevant. You can't be canceled. You got to say X, Y, and Z and have these particular beliefs and make sure you propagate those beliefs online so everybody knows. We can cut through all of that noise with real meaningful relationship. And it's slow, right? It's easier for me to tweet something to several thousand people than it is for me to sit down and have an hour long lunch with a friend and ask about life. It is slow, um, but it's also far more effective, far more deep and enriching uh, and far more human, you know, in the way God 
made us to be. And one more question here with Jay Kim about Analog Christian, cultivating contentment, resilience, and wisdom in the digital age, new from IVP. Um, it's actually, Jay, is probably more of a question from Analog Church, but that book is so interesting because remind us when that book came out, Jay? <laughs> it came out at the end of March 2020, so yeah. two weeks after <laughs> COVID shut everything down. <laughs> An interesting time uh, to be talking about the importance of in-person relationships in church. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, I now, during that time, you and I heard a lot, I mean, really unprecedented levels of enthusiasm and interest in, um, in online church streaming. Let's look back. We've got a, about a, two and a half years or so in retrospect. What have you seen? How did that turn out? Do you still see the same level of enthusiasm? We're not going to need buildings anymore. There won't be locations. We'll just, we'll just do church at home or church in a studio. Um, you see people moving away from that, thinking, oh, I kind of learned our lesson. You know, uh, let me give an analogy there. Um, by necessity, education moved online. Now, there was education online before. That wasn't brand new, just like there were churches that were streaming before. But it seems to me that the, I'm sure this isn't universal, but in my experience, the universal <laughs> response is that virtual education is not education. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a poor facsimile of education. It just seems like, nope, we, that's not like a viable future for, you know, education on a mass scale. Is it different for churches or not? Yeah. You know, I think I, I'm seeing the same thing with churches. Um, now again, it's not, it's not necessarily, you know, monolithic. What I'm not saying is every church in America seems to say, oh, online fell short. And there are certainly churches, particularly larger churches that are leaning in more heavily and saying, this is it. Like this online streaming is actually a campus for us. And we're going to staff a full-time pastor here. And he's going to, he or she is going to pastor the, you know, online congregation and all that. So, so there's a wide variety, but at least in my circles, and I know that's limited, but at least in my circles, what I am seeing, and it's very encouraging to me is not necessarily um, a wholesale rejection of online, but at least uh, uh, a sort of reprioritizing of the embodied in-person experience and then categorizing online in what is, in my estimation, a more healthy way to say um, this is simply... Uh, maybe a front door for folks. You know, I think some of the metrics show that uh, people who step foot into your church for the first time, they typically have seen sort of an online service, you know, between two and three times before they step foot. So I understand all of that. And I think that's a, that's a, a step in the right direction for us to be able to communicate to our congregations at large, um, you know, we're grateful that you're watching this live stream or whatever, but this is just content. This is not the church. And I think uh, I'm encouraged by that. I like what you said about what we're seeing in education. You know, my wife is a high school teacher. She certainly felt that. And she's back in the classroom now. It's a dramatically different experience. Early on, that was actually one of my main concerns is that so many, you know, church leaders and, and, you know, so-called experts were, um, and I'm not mocking them. I just, I just mean, I disagree. They were essentially um, using companies like Amazon and Uber to talk about why the church needed to go totally digital, otherwise be left uh, in the dust. But in reality, for me, my, my argument back always was but churches are not companies like Amazon and Uber that sell goods and services. Churches are more like schools or they're more like hospitals. Would you, would you, you can't get surgery, you know, online. You literally just can't, you have to go. Um, if your child is sick, you don't, your immediate reaction is not, let me call my doctor. If your child is really sick, you rush them to an emergency room because you want a real person to see them. And so goes the church. Um, same with education. So I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing. Again, it's not, you know, everybody, but I think that maybe some of the tide is turning and people are beginning to see the the real need for analog embodied 
experiences. Well, that's good. I'm going to do a final three now with Jay Kim, author of Analog Christian, Cultivating Contentment, Resilience, and Wisdom in the Digital Age. Go ahead and also check out his earlier book, Analog Church. Final three, Jay, how do you find calm in the storm? Christ <laughs> and <laughs> intentional practices to spend time with Jesus. Um, also, uh, history. You know, we talked about history before. Um, I think often these days about the fact that God has led his church through wars and famines and pandemics time and time again, right? Led his people through the wilderness, split open a sea so they could cross on dry land. I just think a lot about history and it brings me a lot of a lot of calm. God will see us through whatever we face today. Mm. That's why we get along so well, Jay. <laughs> Where do you find good news today? Oh, my goodness. Um, well, you know, so many places. I'll just share one that's recent. Um, I find good news in, uh, you know, there's a lot of conversation about churches saying, you know, we're at 50% or 60% of pre-COVID attendance or whatever, um, and for us in our church community, we have stopped talking that way and we've stopped discussing a pre-COVID world. And instead, we're embracing the new reality. And uh, what I am finding is that those who are here, and certainly uh, we are less in physical attendance than we were before COVID, but what I am finding is that that less, um, there's a depth to them and a commitment to them and a commitment to the mission of God in and through our church and then in through their lives that feels very different than what we had two and a half years ago. And I think it um, these might be the seeds for uh, something dramatic and beautiful uh, and gospel-centered in our city and in our country and in our world. So I'm finding a lot of joy, a lot of hope in that. At the risk of asking a follow-up that I already know the answer to, <laughs> uh, do, are those people leaving, just dropped away from church altogether, switched different churches, left California? Yeah, it's all yes. Yeah, that's what I. <laughs> yes that's what I. Answer. That's what I figured. Um, yeah. I just didn't know if you'd see if you were leaning in any one direction there. But I mean, the leaving California dynamic, I think, is it's not unique to California. But you're probably not going to hear a Texas pastor, you know, right. say that. Right. No exactly. Yeah. But. So you're welcome to all you pastors in <laughs> Boise, Idaho, Austin, Texas, <laughs> Denver, right. Colorado, Nashville, Tennessee. <laughs> you're welcome. Please care for our people. Well. Uh, Oh, man. <laughs> last question, Jay. What's the last great book you've read? Oh, my goodness. Um, I just recently wrapped up. I read it for the second time, uh, Managing Leadership Anxiety by Steve Cuss. Oh, um, okay. He's going to be out here at our church doing some work with us. So I just reread his book. It's fantastic, not just for church leaders, but just anybody really uh, on managing anxiety. And then um, I am just beginning Arthur Brooks's new book, oh, yeah. uh, From Strength to Strength. Okay. And uh, it's it's fantastic finding success, happiness, and deep purpose in the second half of life, which I am not at yet. I don't think, but I'm getting closer, <laughs> so I'm reading it preemptively. Yeah, the um, big theme of that book is the post forty downturn in terms mm. of your kind of intellectual capacities and how to transition that into relational experiential strengths. Um, yeah, which I find. Both a little, little jarring, but also um, encouraging <laughs> and insightful yeah. and uh, hopefully catalyzing as well. All right. Thanks, Jay. We've been talking with Jay Kim about Analog Christian, cultivating contentment, resilience, and wisdom in the digital age. Thanks for sharing that wisdom on the podcast as well as in the book. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, thank you so much.